The following podcast is going to contain spoilers, along with an elf who's bitten on the hand by a frickin' squirrel, and then he throws it, and he ends up not really liking squirrels all that much. But then again, why would he? Proceed at your own risk. Hello and welcome to another episode of Just Another Fanboy. I'm your host and my name is Steven. And there's really not much more to say other than that, really. How's it going? He asks, knowing that there's no way you can answer. I mean, you could. You could email me. You, there's all kinds of ways that you could get with me and tell me how you're doing. Feedback at stevenorelse.com. That's one way. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Heck, if you go to the website, justanotherfanboy.com, each episode has an opportunity. It has an area. It has a place. It has a space. It has a face. It doesn't have a face. But it's got a place there for you to leave comments, if and you wanted to. But that's not really the point of the episode. I'm not really here to browbeat you into talking to me because... I mean, I'm kind of a socially awkward guy. If you're if you don't want to talk to me, I'm I'm pretty okay with that. I'm pretty happy with that. I'm I'm usually the guy at the party that doesn't want to be there and is happy just sitting alone and looking sad. Did I just bring the room down a little bit? That wasn't my intention. Anyway, today we're gonna keep moving forward, just keep on swimming, just walking down that path, that elf quest path, the path in which elves are questing. And we're talking about issue number eight today. Issue number eight of the original series. This came out in September of 1980. I would have been eight when this issue came out. Just saying. Just throwing a little perspective down for you. This was, of course, written and illustrated by Wendy Peeney, co-written by Richard Peeney, her husband, the Dream Team. And this issue is entitled Hands of the Symbol Maker. Now, if you remember going back to the previous episode, Cutter and Skywise have set off on a quest. Believe it or not, a couple of elves out there doing some questing. They headed back across the desert through the troll tunnels, back up to where the Holt used to be, which is now a bunch of burnt up trees. And they are out looking for other elves. They had encountered a small family of humans at Sorrow's End, who is escaping something. They had fled across the desert, just like the elves did. And they were told that after the big fire that had driven the elves from their home, these humans had headed into the direction of Sun Goes Down, which we have to assume is west. (laughs) Is that right? Sun rises in the east, sets in the west. And as they journeyed west, unless on this planet the sun rises in the west, I don't know. They actually make note of that later. We'll 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 get to that after a bit. But after they had journeyed in the direction of Sun Goes Down, they came to another forest and more humans. And for some reason, and then they had to leave because one of the one of the humans, the family members, the brother went all crazy in the head. But anyway, it got Cutter to uh want to get out there and find more elves. And so he and Skywise have set out to do that. And that's where we're at now. We actually open up two months. After they have left, we're back in Sorrow's End. There is a particular ritual going on among the Wolf Riders. There is a elf cub that has been born, and young Ember, Cutter's daughter, has come to retrieve it. It's it's in a a little little tunnel, a little cave. It's yipping and yowling, and Ember basically makes note. She makes note. She writes it down. No, she doesn't. None of that. That doesn't happen. She basically says that she's the one that this little wolf cub has been calling for. So this is the wolf that she is going to be bonded with. The wolf riders bond with wolves. They ride them. They they talk to them in their minds. And it's a bond that apparently starts very young. And this is going to be Ember's first wolf. And she picks him up or her. And the wolf immediately just starts licking her face. And so she names him Chop Licker. Well, somebody makes note to Lita. Why do I keep saying that? <laughs> somebody mentions to Lita that Cutter's going to feel sorry that he missed this, because this is a big moment in a wolf rider's life. And this, of course, makes Lita feel bad. And one of the the elves, Moonshade, she kind of lays the old guilt trip down on Lita. She makes her feel bad for not going with Cutter. Cutter's only going to be gone for a year. To the elves, that's not a very long time. But Lita finds that she's missing him quite terribly. And Moonshade throws a little Moonshade at her, 
telling her that she should have gone with him to use the excuse that she needed to be here for her cubs or in the sun folks eyes, her children, wolf riders call them cubs to use that excuse is not really an excuse because in the wolf rider tribe, they raise each other's young. And so the, the two Ember and Suntop would have been just fine with the other wolf riders. And so Moonshade makes Lita feel kind of bad about herself, makes her feel a little selfish. Nightfall comes to her rescue, comes to her defense. And it's as her and Lita go off alone that Lita explains to her that really what it comes down to is the reason why she didn't want to go. Part of it is pride. She 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 felt like she needed to stay behind because no, she's a healer and she needs to stay behind to help the villagers in case of any kind of injury or sickness. But mainly it's because she's afraid. She tells a story about how twice in her life she's borne witness to a solar eclipse. And her father, the sun toucher, as he's called, he's very smart. He's a wise man. He understands what the eclipse is. He explains to her that it's the greater of the two moons passing in front of the sun. And that's all she's seeing. But it's just too big of a concept for her. And it scares her witless. And the thought of going to another land, something different than the desert, a jungle full of possible monsters and other types of animals just scared her too much. And that's why she stayed home. We then catch up with Cutter and Skywise. They're out there trying to rope a horse. And by rope it, they, they have the, the shackles, the leg shackles that they were wearing when they escaped from Picknose in the previous issue. And basically they're running, they're chasing after this horse and they're using the leg shackles as like a bolo and, and, trying to trip the horse up. And we learned that they, this is their third attempt. The first attempt was successful. They got a horse for Skywise, but the second attempt, the horse tripped and broke its neck and died. And now they've got this, this second horse for Cutter. They've never seen an animal like this before. They talk about how it, it it's very similar to a Zwoot, but without a hump. And so they decide to call them no humps, but they need these animals. They need these horses because they're, They've been riding their wolves for two months and their, the pads on their, their paws have, have practically worn through. And they're actually wearing the, the wolves are wearing little booties to protect their pads at this point. And so then we just spend a couple of pages watching them journey through the world of two moons for what ends up being another month. They, they explain that they have been heading towards sun goes down for three months now, or as they put it, three moons. And they explain that Skywise, he's got his lodestone, which is, they they think it's magic because it always points to the north. It's got magnetic properties. And they marked one end of it. The, the, the There's basically two points on it. One point they marked points north, and the other point, of course, points south. And they explain that the right side of the stone is the side that faces morning, and the left side faces sun goes down. So yeah, sun rises in the east, sets in the west. So they've been heading west for three months now, and they have yet to encounter any kind of forest. They're in kind of grasslands, kind of a, a prairie type area. And they're, we're seeing all kinds of various creatures. We do see some wolves, what look like some giant sloths, some kind of weird looking armadillo. But eventually they reach an ancient forest just covered in mist. And they head in. And the first thing that they see as they're heading in is there's a, there's a pool of water and there's a squirrel drowning in the water and cutter decides to be a nice guy and he leans out over the water and holds his bow down and scoops the squirrel out and the squirrel basically runs up his bow and then bites him on his hand which causes cutter to throw the squirrel at a freaking tree and we have to assume that the squirrel dies because it it (laughs) i don't mean to laugh but it 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 i mean I've often described this artwork as kind of Disney-esque. And so if you kind of think of it that way, it's not, it's not really, I mean, it's not, it's not Disney, but it, it resembles it to a certain extent. And so to think of something like this happening in a Disney movie or a Disney comic, just it, I don't know why it just amuses me for some reason. But when he throws this squirrel, he falls into the pool and the pool is just full of dirty, gross, putrid water which of course gets into the wound that the squirrel has bitten into Cutter's hand. And it's not long before Cutter, his hand gets infected. 
But as they're making their way through the forest, they're really they're, they're they're starting to have a really good time. It's been a while since they've been in a forest like this. It reminds them of home. They find some trees that were very obviously shaped by elves, but a long, long time ago. And they just keep moving deeper and deeper into the forest until eventually the infection really starts taking its toll on Cutter. And he almost falls out of a tree. Skywise catches him before he falls and Cutter in his pride gives him a lot of crap about that. What are you doing? Let me go. I know what I'm doing. I'm not going to fall. And then eventually he does. He passes out and he falls out of the tree. And that's when they kind of realize, yes, his hand is infected. He is, his skin is burning hot. His hand looks terrible. And he's got this, what they consider poison running through his veins. And so Skywise heads out. There's a certain plant that he's looking for. Whistling leaves is what he calls them. He needs to go find them for him to chew. And so he and Star Jumper head off. Star Jumper would be his wolf. They leave Night Runner, which is Cutter's wolf, with him. And at one point, Cutter, he's, de- he's, he's, dizzy, he's delirious, he's weak. He crawls toward a stream to get a drink of water and he passes out with his head in the stream and Night Runner is there to pull him out. And that's when Cutter sees off in the distance a black wolf, just a solid black wolf. And he recognizes it. It's his father's wolf, Blackfell, which kind of disturbs him a little because Blackfell's dead and so is Bearclaw, which is his father. And so the wolf, he he sees it and it starts to walk away and he realizes that it's it's got to be some kind of spirit guide. And so he goes walking off after it. Night Runner doesn't like this at all, but he follows him as well. The black wolf disappears, and that's when he sees his parents, Bearclaw and Joyleaf. He tries to talk to him. He's telling them that he got bit in the hand by a squirrel, and he's going to die, and he feels really stupid about it. And if his his new wife, Lita, if she was with him, she'd be able to to heal him in a heartbeat. And then he starts telling them about, you know, I have... That's he's like, yeah, I've got a life mate. Her name's Lita and I've got two strong cubs and I have to return to them. I've promised them that I'm going to return and I can't I can't die like this. And then his parents kind of beckon to him, like come into the light. And he he ends up, you know, no, he denies them. He's like, no, I can't. He runs away. And so he's stumbling through the forest and he just starts seeing all kinds of things. He's just all kinds of delirious and he's hallucinating and he sees just this bright fiery light. He sees Lita in the light and he runs toward it. And then he stumbles into a clearing and we find that the bright fiery light is actually a campfire. And there's a human woman sitting at the campfire and he stumbles into the clearing and just passes out. The human woman mistakes him for a child and she goes over and picks him up, sees that he's injured somehow and realizes that she needs to care for him. But as soon as she picks him up, Night Runner just comes bursting out of the forest and attacks her. Well, behind her is a is basically a cave, and it looks like that's where she lives with her husband or her mate. He hears her screaming, and he, he comes running out, and he snatches up a branch from the fire. So he's basically got a torch now, and he starts doing battle with Night Runner, and he ends up burning Night Runner on the side of the face. It doesn't quite stop Night Runner at first because he's he's very protective of Cutter, of course. And it's not until he really, he really hits him in the side of the head with this torch and really does some damage to that wolf that the wolf ends up running away. Well, in the meantime, the woman, Nona is her name, has taken Cutter into their little hut, into their little cave, their little dwelling, and she screams. The man hears her and he rushes into the cave to find Cutter standing there with his sword. She had tried to help, Nona had tried to help him and he cut her because his name is Cutter. And of course, she's a human. He doesn't trust humans. Humans are there to kill elves. That's what they do. And he's telling them, don't come any closer. And Nona's talking to her husband and she's saying that he can, he speaks their language, but it's, it's, it's very strange. He sounds very strange. She can barely understand him. And her husband says, well, look, look at him. Look at his eyes. That's not a child. Cutter goes to leave. There's a big, like, uh, sheet of some kind of animal hide that's covering their, it's like their door. And he stabs at it with the sword and slices it open and he tries to escape. And Nona is telling her husband that she can't, she can't let him run away because he's going to, he's sick, he's infected. And if he, he runs away, he's going to die alone in the forest. And so they snatch him back up and they bring him back in, which as far as he's concerned, he's being captured by humans and they're going to torture him and they're going to kill him. So in the meantime, Night Runner, he has made his escape and he's trying to find 
Skywise. He knows that Cutter's friend is Skywise, and he knows Skywise's scent. So he's he's off to find Skywise. Back with the humans, Cutter is freaking terrified. He wants to fight back. He wants to escape. But because of his sickness, because of his infection, he's weak and he can barely move. And yet the humans don't kill him right away. And that confuses him. He doesn't understand. And Nona kind of cradles him in her arms and she takes a little bowl of water and she's dabbing cool water onto his skin to try to bring his fever down. And he's pulling away from her. But again, he's he's really weak. His, his every instinct is telling him that they're going to kill him. But he's really confused because, again, they haven't done it yet. And they seem to be caring for him. And finally, he just kind of gives over to it. And he says, I didn't know that humans could be so kind. And she explains to him that his folk, she, so she knows basically what he is. She calls him a spirit, a bird spirit from the mountain, and that his people have always been very good to her. Her husband, Adar, A-D-A-R, Adar, Adar, I don't know how you pronounce it. He has heard her talk about these bird spirits a lot, but he's never seen one. So you kind of get the feeling that they're from different areas. And she starts to worry a bit because she's afraid that Cutter is going to die. And she's afraid that if he was with his people, they would be able to heal him. But their own clumsy efforts are going to are only going to make things worse. And Adar basically tells her, eh, you worry about that. I'm going to mend the door. I don't know what's going on here. I don't understand the whole bird spirit thing or what you're talking about. I know that you've known about these creatures and you've told me about him before. And she's a, she's, she's an artist. She's like a symbol maker. And she, we find out that she, she's like a cave painter and she's done a lot of cave paintings, um, featuring these bird spirits, but he's like, I'm going to fix the door. Cause that's something I know. That's something I can do. That's something I understand. So we go back to Skywise and he cannot find any of these freaking plants that he needs. There's something, he sees something creeping out there in the dark. It looks like some type of freaking lizard walking around on two legs. You kind of get the idea that there's that this this world, the world of two moons, is very kind of prehistoric, that there are still dinosaurs and whatnot running around, but you don't really see many of them. There you never really see them. They're always in shadows. Anytime you see something like that, it's it's very shadowy and you're not quite certain what they are. Well he hears suddenly the wind whistling through these whistle plants or whatever they're called. And so he finds them, he cuts some of the leaves up to take back with him. And that's when Night Runner joins him. Night Runner can't really communicate to Skywise. Only wolves that are bonded to the elves can, can communicate to him. But he can see, obviously, right off the bat that Night Runner has been burned. And he just asks, you know, out loud, was it humans? And Night Runner reacts in such a way that, yeah, it's fairly obvious. It was uh, humans that have done that. And so they go racing off and Skywise is following Night Runner back to the humans encampment where the, the couple live. And poor old Adar, he just gets finished mending the door. He's stitched up the great cut down the middle of this animal hide door when Skywise slices it right back open. And he and Starjumper launch into the cave, ready to take out the humans. But Cutter yells out to him, you know, don't, don't do it. Don't kill him. And so he sends to Skywise, they communicate in their heads. And he just tells them, look, just, just do what I say. Let the humans be. Skywise gives Cutter the leaves of this plant and tells him to chew them up. Cutter eats as many as he can. It says that they're very sour tasting leaves. And then as soon as he eats as much as he can, he steps outside. And we have, they don't explain it. But to me, it sounds like what's going on here is is the plants don't really have any medicinal purposes other than the fact that they make him throw up, which whatever poisons are running through him come out when he throws up, which... I don't know. You think he could have just done that with his fingers. Skywise is then left alone with these humans, and he's not really all that happy about it. He has some kind of memory when he was an infant of his mother, and it appears that maybe she was taken away from him by humans, abducted by two humans on a raft, and they took her off down the river, leaving him alone. So he's just sitting there in their cave, just facing these two humans with his sword out the entire time. And at one point, Adar tells his wife, he says, no, no, you have said that I must be respectful, but bird spirit or not, I'll break him in two if he doesn't drop that knife to which Skywise says, try it. It's kind of Skywise's version of, you feel lucky? Huh? Do you punk? That's when Cutter comes back. And of course, he's not too happy about Night Runner being burned. Adar, of course, is like, look, I didn't really have a lot of choice. He would have killed both me and Nona if I hadn't done that. You know that. 
I didn't mean it uh, maliciously. I was just trying to protect me and my wife. And Cutter begrudgingly understands. And that's when Nona takes them into the back of the cave to share with them the the symbols, the cave paintings that she's done to kind of tell her story about the the bird spirits. As they're they're heading to the back of the cave, Cutter and Skywise are, are, are talking telepathically and Cutter basically says that he wishes that Suntop were here because his 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 boy can sense if something was shaped by magic. And the way that this cave has been formed, it doesn't look natural. And he feels like the cave was formed, was shaped by elves, which Skywise isn't buying because they know for, they know that there are elves that can shape wood and plants and trees, but they've never heard of a rock shaper. And so he's like, eh, I don't know if I can buy that. So Nona shows him the cave paintings that she's made. And basically it's very crude renderings of elves holding spears on the backs of giant birds. And then there's a blue mountain that they're circling. Cutter asks her where this mountain is. And she she thinks that he's testing her because he's obviously a bird spirit. He looks just like the other ones. She had explained to uh, Adar earlier that obviously he's a bird spirit. Look at his ears. They're, they're wide and pointy like a wing or a pair of wings. So she tells Cutter, you know, obviously you're testing me. Don't worry, I haven't forgotten. There are many, it's a many days walk from here beyond the woods, beyond the valley of endless sleep. And then she wants to know if they are there to take her back and basically asks him, you know, please don't take me back there. Don't take me. I don't want to, I don't want to be apart from Adar. And Cutter's like, no, we're not, we're not there to, to take you back. And she doesn't seem to be opposed to going back. She just does, she just doesn't think Adar would go with her. She doesn't want to be parted with him. But Cutter and Skywise realize that they have to go check this place out. Now, the one thing that Nona tells them, because Cutter asks, he's, he's like, well, you know, we haven't uh, we haven't been back at the mountain for a long time. It's It's been so long that we don't even quite remember what life is like back there at the Blue Mountain. And asks if the other spirits, you know, if, if they're different than the other spirits that live there. And she says, she tells them only in size, you seem much smaller than they are. And that's when they decide they need to go see this blue mountain and find these elves. Meanwhile, we go back to Sorrow's End. Sava has been out in her astral form. And we find that she can't get back into her own body. She's now trapped. Suntop realizes that this has happened. He can feel this. He can feel the, the magic that's keeping her from coming back. Her handmaiden comes out of of the dwelling where she lives and she comes to Lita and, you know, tells her there's something wrong with Sava. She needs your help. And Lita's like, there's, there's nothing I can do. This isn't a physical injury. This is some kind of spiritual, magical thing that's going on. And Suntop climbs into Sava's lap and presses his forehead to her forehead. And then they stay that way for a while. And he finally comes back down and he, he tells everybody that he basically went into her mind. He went out to find her and wherever she's at, it's very dark and it's very scary. And she's trying to get back and he tried to help her find her way back, but it's going to take her a long time. She's, she's lost. And then he tells Lita that she has to take him to his father. You need to take me to father. I need to tell him what Sava saw. He needs to be warned. Tree stump. One of the wolf riders says, well, can't you just tell us? Tell us. We'll go find him. We'll tell him. And she says, no, I have to be there. It's all in my head, and it's not going to be able to come out until I'm with tell him with my dad. And that's when Lita kind of starts realizing. She's like, I didn't want to go with him in the first place because I was afraid. But now it seems like I don't have any other choice. And that's how the issue ends. So a lot of big things happen in this issue. We get... uh we meet some humans that aren't evil just off the bat. They help Cutter and Skywise. And, and we're going to meet some elves later that maybe aren't quite what we expect them to be there at the Blue Mountain. Again, if you want to read along with me, go to ElfQuest.com. You can read all these issues for free. This was issue number eight. If you just go to ElfQuest.com and choose the option to read, I think that's I think that's what it says. It's read online. You can you can read all these along with me. They're they're just this is just some epic storytelling. Again, I think I said last week I often wonder as I'm reading these how I would feel about them reading them now if I had never read them before. And I'd like to think I'd still be enjoying them that it's it's not just the nostalgia, but this was, you know, at a time when all I was reading was superhero comic books. Maybe the occasional Conan. I don't know if I would, if I had been introduced to Conan comic books at this point, but I know I had been introduced to Dungeons and Dragons 
So I was familiar with a, a fantasy type world with elves and swords and sorcery and all this stuff. And this is, this is not quite the same as Dungeons and Dragons. Um, it's very, it's very much not a classic Tolkien like fantasy world, but it sure is a lot of fun. If you're reading along, tell me what you think. Is this your first time reading it? Did you read it back in the day where you ate the first time you read this and you're reading it again for the first time, you know, since then? Or is this something that you have to get, sit down and read every couple of years? You know, I'd, I'd really be interested to know. I mentioned at the top of the show all the various ways that you can provide feedback and let me know your thoughts. And I really like the answer to some of these questions. Are you reading ElfQuest? Have you read it before? Are you reading it now simply because I'm reading it and you want to follow along? Or are you just listening to the episodes, have never read the books, never plan on reading to the reading the books? I want to know. I need to know what's going on out there, folks. You got to tell me. Are you reading ElfQuest? Yes or no? And then get down to the nitty gritty. If you are reading it, or if you've read it before, if you're familiar with these stories, who's your favorite character? Who's your favorite one? Mine was always Strongbow for a long time. Strongbow and Tree Stump. Strongbow and Tree Stump. I always liked both of them and Skywise. But I think I mentioned on a previous episode that, you know, I had the role-playing game. I had lead figures. I was just, man, for a few years there, I was just neck deep in some elf quest. And I would design my own characters uh, using the idea that they could be bonded with an animal. And I think I had some Arctic characters that, that rode polar bears and stuff like that. And this was just a world that I really always enjoyed immersing myself in. And I'm, and I'm having fun doing it all over again. And, and I would really like to know if y'all are doing the very same thing right along with me. So feedback at Stephen or else.com. Just come to the website. Just another fanboy. Leave a comment on the episode. You can find, you can find me over at the Patreon at patreon.com slash Stephen R. Or you can leave comments there and heck, Support me for as low as a dollar a month while you're over there. You might as well find me over at the at the YouTube. I'm now doing live streams once a week that you can get in on and, and participate in by throwing comments and asking questions during the live stream. And frankly, it doesn't cost you anything to subscribe over there at that YouTube channel. Every, subs- every person that subscribes helps me out. So do that, please. I implore you. Until then, I'm going to wrap this up. My name is Steven, and I'm just another fanboy. Be nice to each other. Wear a mask. Be safe. Our year is almost at an end. I can't believe it's going to be 2021 in less than two months. Heck, just a little over a month. It's pretty freaking crazy because you guys are getting this on December the 1st. My brother's birthday. Happy birthday, David. I don't know if he's listening. Anyway, I'm out. Good job. The following podcast is going to contain spoilers along with an elf who gets bitten in the hand by a big piece of poop.